You're going to get fired. You're going to be in so much trouble. Yes, I want the Maserati. Yes, I want the Academy Award. I wanted it when I was 12, and I still want it to this day. Hi, I'm Lois Lowry, and I'm an author. And you don't recognize me because authors hide behind their books. And uh, we aren't highly visible. And we like that. I shouldn't speak for everybody. I like that. I have twice in my life been walking down a street, once in New York, once in Los Angeles, with a very famous person. In both cases, happened to be an actor. And it was kind of horrifying to see the way people on a street react to a famous face. Uh, mm -hmm. They invade you and grab at you, not at me, but at the person I was with. So uh, with that in mind, I am delighted to be anonymous. Authors, of course, have their pictures often on the back of a book. But what happens is the book's out there for years and years, and then people meet you and they say, oh, you don't look at all like this. And that's yeah. because you were 20 years younger when that picture was taken. So, at any rate, here I am, uh, not in a photograph, but in a right. video, I guess. In a video. And now you can see me, uh, but for the most part, I like to be anonymous. Yeah, I can understand that. I mean, I, I've, I've been to events. I usually go to conventions, and yeah, they're just swarmed constantly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, a little bit of privacy is probably a nice thing. I mean, but um, that, of course, this year, there is has been a lot of staying at home. And, you know, um, it's been an obviously a difficult year due to COVID. How was your year? How was your 2020? Uh, that's, that's another realm in which authors, again, I shouldn't speak for everybody, but it's fair to say, I think, that most writers are introverts, and mm -hmm. uh, we like to be alone, and in fact, we can't do what we do unless we do it in a solitary place. Often, I, when I've spoken to kids, because kids are most often the audience I write for, and back when the world was normal, I uh, frequently would visit kids in schools. And I would ask them, how many people here think they'd like to be a writer when they grow up? And lots of hands would go up. And uh, then I would tell them the good things about being a writer. And the bad thing for some of them is that you have to do it all alone. You have to sit in a room by yourself day after day. And you don't get to talk to your friends while you're doing your work. If you're a teacher, a doctor, uh, whatever, my husband is a psychiatrist, uh, you get to talk to the people you're, you're working with. But writers work all by themselves. So with that in mind, uh, the year of the pandemic was not a hardship for me. It gave me the solitude to do what I do anyway but I didn't have to interrupt myself again and again. I actually had to cancel a seven city book tour. I had a new book published in April of, I've lost all track of time, 2020, and I had to cancel it uh, because everything had been locked down. And although the publishers don't like to cancel such an event because it sells books, yeah. and we writers like to sell books too, Nonetheless, uh, it meant that I did not have to go to airports, get on planes, miss planes, connect with planes, lose my luggage, check into hotels, forget what city I was in, uh, go and talk to a large audience, and then go to the next airport. It's, it's, uh, it's a, a burdensome part of a writer's career to go out and promote books. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to do that because of the pandemic. Uh, I did a lot of Zooming. Yeah. Uh, in order to take the place of those events. But I got to do it from this very room where I'm sitting today. So not to say that I liked the pandemic, <laughs> but I will say that it served me well. I was working on a new book, required a lot of research. I could do that all right here in my home. Well, that's awesome that you got to something positive out of it. And um, could you tell, is there anything that you can tell us about your new book, the one you're promoting? Oh, I can do, we can do some plugs too. 
<laughs> okay. Um, the new book for which I just did the research is not yet published, so I'm not going to yeah. talk about that yet. Uh, the book that I was supposed to be out there on the road talking about, which was published a year ago, is called On the Horizon. Wait a minute. This is what it looks like. It's uh, somewhat autobiographical. The little oh. girl on the, on the cover is me uh, with my grandmother, though she looks more like a nursemaid. Um, and uh, it deals with three sets of events. The first third of the book is about Pearl Harbor. I was born in Honolulu. I discovered only as an adult looking at old home movies that my father had taken. I was born in 1937, so these are primitive home movies. Uh, but my father was a good photographer. Film of me on the beach with my grandmother. And uh, I had never before noticed, though I'd seen those movies many, many times, until someone pointed out to me, and it happened to be a retired naval officer, that on the horizon in that film, there was the outline of a ship. It was kind of shrouded in fog, but he was a graduate of Annapolis Naval Academy, and he recognized it from its structure. He said, yeah. that's the Arizona. Now, young people don't recognize that name, but it's an iconic name in the history of warfare, sadly. Uh, the Arizona was a battleship sunk at Honolulu. Uh, at Pearl Harbor in 1941. And when I realized that I was a child playing happily on a beach, laughing in this movie, and behind me on the horizon, title of the book, were 1,200 mostly very young men who would very soon all die, <clears throat> I began to be haunted by that. And I didn't know what to do with it. It didn't form a plot. Uh, it wasn't suspenseful, really. It took me a long time to work that through in my brain and connect it with two other parts of my life and put them together in this book. So the first third is about those young men on the battleship Arizona. I researched their lives, uh, chose some of them to include. Second third of the book takes place five years later and it uh, takes place in Japan with the bombing of Hiroshima and focuses on one little boy who lived in a town 50 miles away, who was about to be eight years old in August of 1945, and who suddenly felt the earth shake and saw the sky change. And he was seeing the bombing of that city and the destruction of that city 50 miles from his home. Okay, so. The second third of the book focuses, again, after research, on the individuals, mostly young people I selected, whose lives were affected by that day, Japanese children. And the third part of the book takes place several years later when uh, my father was a career army officer and he had been in the Pacific throughout the war, had to stay in Japan at the end of the war. And we went there, uh, my sister, brother, and I, children, and our mother, uh, to live in Tokyo after the war ended. My father bought me a bicycle, and uh, I write about the bicycle in the book. And Tokyo had been badly bombed, it had burned, yeah. Uh, they were beginning to put it back together. And uh, I used to ride my bike out through that ruined city. And I rode my bike one day, this moment is in the book, past a Japanese school. I attended an international school. I rode my bike past a Japanese school, stopped and watched the children on the playground. And there was a little boy who stared at me and I at him. And uh, we didn't speak. We had been enemies, of course, uh, until not long before. We didn't speak the same language, though he was learning English and I was learning Japanese. Uh, but we simply stared at each other and then went our separate ways. Fifty years later, when my book, let me grab a copy here, this book won the Newbery Medal, I went to 
Miami, where the convention was held, where that award was given. At the same time that the Newbery Medal is awarded, the Caldecott Medal is awarded for the best illustrated book of the year. The Newbery is for the best written book. Let me see if I can find this. I should have thought of this in advance. Ta-da! This was the book that won the uh, Caldecott Medal for the best illustrated book that year. And the illustrator was Japanese, and he signed it for me. We had breakfast together. To Lois Lowry, it says, with love and admiration, he drew a little picture of himself, signed his name, and uh, I gave him a copy of The Giver. And I signed it to him, and I didn't draw a picture of myself, but I wrote my name in Japanese, he oh, being wow. Japanese. And he looked at me and said, how is it that you can do that? And I said, oh, I lived in Japan when I was a kid. Where did you live, he said. Tokyo, so did I, he said. What part of Tokyo? Shibuya, I said. So did I, he said. We went on like that until he said, were you the girl on the green bicycle? Not only was he the little boy on the schoolyard who had stared at me that day when we were both 11 years old, but he was also the little boy who had seen the bomb destroy Hiroshima because he had lived in a little village uh, as a small child. And so it's his story in On the Horizon. It's my story, and it's the story of our connection to each other. And it really is the story of everybody's connection to each other, how we all, in whatever way, have a connection to the person uh, across the globe the person in the mud mm -hmm. hut in Africa, the person in the Japanese village. Uh, the world is very small now. But we all, we all are connected, and that's what that book tries to say. Wow, uh, that story. I, what are the odds? <laughs> you know, if I had <coughs> written that in a novel, submitted it as fiction to an editor. The editor would have written in the margin of the manuscript <coughs> credibility issues here uh, because it was too much of a coincidence. It's yeah. the kind of thing that that uh, the an editor would say, let's take that out. Nobody would believe that. Uh, and yet it happened. I uh, I got an email from, from uh, him the other day. We've remained friends. Really? He lives in the... Uh, uh, state of Oregon now with his Japanese wife. Wow, awesome. And As a matter um, of fact, when the pandemic began, he emailed me and he said, we're in a new kind of war and we're both on the same side. He said a new war has started and he was speaking of the virus and he said we're, oh. we're on the same side this time. We're not enemies. Oh, wow. I mean, it's true. So I should have said his name. His name is Alan. Uh, his Japanese name was Koichi Sei, and I've used that in the book. But he has changed since he's lived in the United States. He's using a, an American first name. He's Alan Sei, S-A-Y. Wow. If you could tell your, your story, I mean, that covered uh, some good topics, but uh, just maybe a little bit on your career and the... The sure. taking off of your career part, yeah. Uh, you know, everybody's story begins way, way back. Yeah. I was very fortunate to be born into a family that valued books. My mother had been a teacher before she married. She was had been a kindergarten teacher. She never worked after she was married, but she was a wonderful mother to small children. And she read to us all the time. And I had a sister three years older who began school when she was six and I was three. And my sister came home every day and taught me everything she had learned, uh, mostly about how to read. And because I was so familiar with the books of my childhood, and my sister explained how the letters had sounds and they went together to make the words, then I could pick up a book I was familiar with and almost immediately could make that connection and could read. It just opened up 
the world to me. And I entered the world of books that I've been part of ever since. By the time I was eight, perhaps, I knew that I wanted to be a writer. And I, you know, I, I followed the regular educational path. But when I went to college, I did so with a, spe a special scholarship to study writing. I went to Brown University. But <laughs> if I were telling this as a story, as a, as a novel, as a piece of fiction, it would follow this trajectory. And so she began uh, to study writing, but she was interrupted because stories always take these diversions. Mm -hmm. uh, someone has a goal, but they run into obstacles and they have to solve them. Uh, this, this, I guess, would be an obstacle, but it didn't require solving. Uh, the impediment to my career at that point was my own, I guess stupidity would not be too strong a word, but it was partly the times. This was not unusual. I dropped out of college just after my 19th birthday to get married. Mm -hmm. uh, women did that then. Uh, my boyfriend, and he was just a boy too, I had just turned 19, he was 21, had just graduated from college. <clears throat> he was being commissioned in the Navy and he wanted to get married. And of course, then so did I. So I dropped out of college and then I had a baby when I was 20. I had a baby when I was 21. I had a baby when I was 23. I had a baby when I was 24. And suddenly I still wanted to be a writer but I was 25 years old and I had four children under the age of five. So it took me a long time. When my youngest child, Ben, I had two boys, two girls, uh, Ben began kindergarten at age five and I went back to college. It took me four years to complete my bachelor's degree. I went on for a master's. And then finally, uh, I began to write professionally. My first book was published when I was 40 years old. So it had taken me a long time to get to the place where I'd always wanted to be. Uh, but maybe all of that was part of the experience that I needed in order mm. to write. Maybe if I had graduated from college at age 21, uh, I wouldn't have been ready to be a writer. In fact, I remember a professor in college telling me that I could be a writer, that I had whatever gifts were necessary and education had enhanced, that I could be a writer. He said, but you haven't experienced much yet. Uh, you need to experience grief, he said. And I remember trudging away from his office thinking, what does he know, an old guy like that? He was probably yeah. 45. <laughs> and, uh, and yet, I then went on to live the kind of life that gave me those experiences, including grief, because we all do suffer that if we live long enough. Uh, and then I began to write. So I was 40, as I said, when my first book was published. It's still in print. And let me do the math. That was published in 1977. How oh, are you better at math than I am? 45. Uh, 45 years ago? My mom was born in 76, so I'm okay. trying to think. It could be 45 or 46. At any rate, it was a long time ago. Uh, and it's quite amazing that it's still in print. But uh, I have now, 46 years later, uh, written, I think, the book that will be published next year will be probably my 50th. And uh, so I have been busy all those years, working hard at it, uh, loving every minute of it. And uh, that's my story. That's fantastic. And I think that it shows that, um, well, it's never too late, I mean, to do what you want to do. But at the same time, it might be too early. <laughs> that's uh, you're absolutely right. That's that's what I was taking a long time to say, and you you just tied it up <laughs> into one sentence, and it's absolutely right. Timing is everything, and uh, for me, the timing has worked. I'm also very fortunate that I am now 84 years old, 
but my brain is still intact. And not everybody 84 <laughs> years old can say that, I suppose, because I can still put together uh, the words to, to create a book, as I've spent the past year doing. That's fantastic. Um, I got to talk to a, an artist and author named Ashley Bryan. I'm not sure if you've heard oh, of the name. Oh, let me just interrupt you to say Ashley is a very dear friend of mine. Is he? Yes, yes. Oh, wow. I, I spoke with him a couple weeks ago. Oh, well, was he in Texas or Maine? Do you know? Uh, he was in Texas. Yeah. Uh, I'm in Maine. And right. uh, he lives in Maine in the summertime. But he's 97 now? 90. Yeah, he's turning 98. Yeah, soon. In July is his birthday. Yeah. Yes. Dear, dear man, I'm looking as we speak at, at a piece of art that Ashley gave me. It's right over there. Wow. I'll it to you. Wait a minute. Sure, I'm gonna sure. This around. Wait a minute. I have a better idea. I'm going to go take it off the wall and show it to you. I have in another room, I have a very large painting of Ashley's. This is a small woodcut. Wow. He's titled it Cookie, Cookie Jar. There That's really cool. At any rate, Ashley is a dear, dear man that I've known for probably 50 years. Yeah, but I was, you were saying just to be, a, be a, the ability to still continue uh, your creativity. And yes. he's done that as well. And, and at 97, uh, speaking to him was, was remarkable, you know. Uh, and I, you probably didn't have the occasion to hear him do this, but Ashley has a brain filled with poetry and mm. if you're talking about a particular subject he will suddenly begin to quote a lengthy poem i i um, he's just amazing he's an amazing man he did happen to speak um it sounded like he was saying a poem when he was explaining his life to me it was just it, it really sounded poetic yes yeah he's yeah. had he's had a remarkable life yeah, he just he's I'm expecting his a copy of his memoir and I'm going to be reading that. He signed it and sent it to me uh, this week. Do you mean the one about his time in the army? Uh, yeah, Infinite Hope, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah. beautiful book. Yeah. I can't wait to read it. And then yeah. uh, a little the last little bit is your advice uh, or a message that you give to the youth. And that's always hard, too. Yeah. Uh, I Last year, or the year before the pandemic closed us all down, I was asked to speak at a high school graduation. Of course, that's oh. the time in which you're supposed to impart wisdom. And uh, I realized I didn't have very much. <laughs> uh, I, I will say that one of the reasons I'm able to write for young people is because I do have the kind of memory that goes back, how can I describe this? I can re-experience my, my young life. I can re-enter my young self, and I can re-feel the feelings that I felt. Uh, and so when I stood in front of that high school graduation class, uh, I, was, I was feeling as if I was 17 years old. Uh, this is not answering your question and imparting wisdom okay. and advice, um, but I did I did tell them, though I had to speak for half an hour and did so, I did tell them that if I could give people only three bits of advice when they were young, I would, let me see if I can remember the third, I would tell them to read, to travel, and to vote. Uh, I was feeling very political at that time, mm -hmm. as I still am, because these are strange political times. But that's one bit of advice I would give kids, whether they want to be writers or artists or whatever, uh, to take an interest in their government. Because mm -hmm. those kids, and you're one of them, I mean, are, are you still in high school? Yeah, I'm about to graduate. Okay, well... Uh, you guys are going to determine the future. Yeah. And boy, it's never more important than it is right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you. That was awesome. Um, I, had a, I have a couple questions just uh, from me. And 
I actually live in Niagara Falls in on the Canadian side. I'm in Canada. Have you ever uh, have you ever seen the falls? I have, and I like the Canadian side better than the American side. I, it was many years ago when I was there. This may no longer be true, but when I was there, there was a lot of commercial stuff yeah. on the American <laughs> side, and it was much more tasteful on the Canadian side. Yeah, yeah. Now it's the American side is pretty. Um, I mean, from what I can see from this side, it's uh, there's not a lot going on. But then again, we are in a pandemic. so. Well, people have not been traveling. Uh, yeah. But you certainly live in a beautiful spot. Absolutely. It's right in the backyard. And then I was wondering, um, just, because, just myself, um, how you deal with or if you struggle with staying awake more than you should to do things like... I really don't know how to phrase that question. How do you deal with uh, managing time? There we go. Oh, okay. Good question. I don't think everybody's, anybody has ever asked me that before. But again, uh, a writer uh, makes her or his own hours. Right. Uh, I could if I wanted to. I don't usually. Uh, get up at midnight and, and work and sleep during the day, and nobody would know or care. I mean, my husband would, because he wouldn't get his meals. Uh, but I don't, I'm don't. i not beholden to anybody. I don't have to fill out a, a time form the way people do. I, I think the luckiest people in the world are the ones who love what they do for work. And so many people don't. So many people go off every day to a job that they hate. Yeah. Um, but I love what I do, <clears throat> and part of what I love is that I'm my own boss. Nobody tells me what to do. Uh, I, I After I finish writing a book, I then, of course, have to give it to a publisher and, and accept their advice and do revisions according to their suggestions. But I'm really the one in charge, and yeah. I like that aspect of it. And that includes time management. Because I love what I do, I do it all the time. I, I do it uh, many hours every day because I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing. And even when I'm not sitting at my computer, actually typing words into the computer and eventually onto a page, my mind is always working, particularly if I'm in the middle of a book. I, I can't do anything else take a walk, be with friends, uh, without my mind still working on the book. A lot of uh, what takes place takes place in my subconscious uh, so that I often stop working at the end of a day. I try to stop at a place where I know what's going to happen next and where I'm excited about what I'm what paragraph I'm working on, because then it's easy to go back to. I do advise young writers, who they always worry about writer's block and getting right. stuck. And of course that does happen. But uh, if it's, it's a mistake to stop when you're stuck, because then you don't want to go back to it. But I stop when I'm excited, which is most of the time, and then I pick it up again the next day, and I find that even in my sleep, uh, it, my brain has worked on it and things have come to me. So a lot of what happens in a writer's mind is happening below the surface and yeah, in, the, on the, in the sub, subconscious. Absolutely. I, I, I watched, a, the, there was a movie that came out and, uh, with Will Ferrell in it and um, I liked that one because it, it kind of, I felt like it puts you in the mind of, uh, of an author. And uh, you, you are thinking, you'll be driving on the road, and then it'll just pop into your head, right? Oh, that's what I should uh, do. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, here's a, <laughs> a deeply held secret. But I've heard this from other authors. Some, sometimes when I get talking to friends who are writers, we, this will pop up. And, and it seems to be true of other people, not just me. Uh, the shower <laughs> is where you get great ideas. Uh, it must be something about the relaxation of warm water. Uh, yeah. Maybe if you were sitting under a waterfall, as I have done in Hawaii, actually, uh, 
but uh, ideas amazingly come into your mind in those circumstances whatever works yeah well thank you so much for joining me uh, it means a lot okay thank you it's good to talk to you yeah absolutely i really enjoyed the giver in grade eight we did <laughs> a required reading in grade eight it was a required reading but but I actually enjoyed it because I, I uh, it was right up my alley in genre, so uh -huh. uh, I did enjoy it very much so, and so I, it makes me happy that you decided to talk with me. Did you know that there are three books that follow The Giver? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so I get so many emails every day from kids who are troubled by the ending because it's a little am ambiguous yeah. and I'm able to tell them keep reading the other books and you'll find out what happened <laughs> yeah that was that was the big thing when we were in grade eight was the ending and but um yeah definitely go check out the the other two books to, to find out what happens um is there anything else that you'd like to promote or talk about before we head out no I can't think of a thing all right but well. I wish you luck with your own projects uh, Thank it you. sounds like you're having fun doing it. It is fun. And I loved what you said about doing what you what you love because, yeah. you know, it's advice that a lot of people give, but it's because it's the truth. And yeah. um, I've spoken to Carol Burnett and we talked to Ed Asner. Um, and it's basic, I'm basically just targeting role models for all kinds of different uh, careers. And I'll just add one thing. I mentioned mm -hmm. walking on a street with a famous actor, at right. one in Los Angeles, one in New York. And because I mentioned how gracious they were toward the people who accosted them and interrupted them, uh, I, I'm just going to say who they were because I, I, I admired that in them. Uh, and one was Jeff Bridges, right. who could not have been more gracious. People see him across the street and they, hey, dude, and then they run over and say, can I give you a hug? And he, he just could not have been nicer. Uh, was uh, in Los Angeles, Sean Astin. Uh, oh, Sean. Ways, and and, and num numerous movies. He also, I was with him once, a woman came running up and asked if he would sign the cast on her broken arm. And he smiled it, and signed the cast. I guess it's the price you pay for being famous, but good for them. It is, for it is. Being gracious. Okay. Yeah. Alrighty.